Welcome to the noon lecture at the Center for Japanese Studies. My name is Allison Alexi. I'm an assistant professor in the departments of Asian Languages and Cultures and Women and Gender Studies. It's my pleasure this year to be the official host of Dr. Huaji Shin, the Toyota Visiting Professor at the Center for Japanese Studies, and my honor to introduce her today. Um, so Professor Huaji Shin, this year's Toyota Visiting Professor at the Center for Japanese Studies, is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of San Francisco. She holds degrees from Kansai Gaida University and the University of Wisconsin, as well as a PhD in sociology from SUNY Stony Brook, where she received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. Her research focuses on the political sociology with an, with, on political sociology with an emphasis on social movements, race and ethnicity, intergroup conflicts, categorical and spatial inequalities, particularly in urban settings, globalization, colonization, and the history, theory, and, and sociology of migration, citizenship, and nationalism. As we'll hear today, her published work includes articles on the influence of globalization on social movements among Korean minority groups in Japan. She's currently writing a book about Japan's history of making nationhood, um, migration, and citizenship and is also working on a comparative project which investigates the housing affordability and accessibility and in relation to categorical and spatial inequalities in both the US and Japan. So if we were all together in one place, I would say please join me in welcoming, but I hope you can join me in welcoming Professor Hua Ji Shin from wherever you are and, and enjoy her presentation with us all together. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you all can see my slide. Okay, um, just wanted to make sure. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. And um, uh, thank you so much for the very kind and thoughtful introduction, Alison. It is such a pleasure and an honor to give a talk at the CJS. And I also thankful for their co-sponsorship from NAM Center, Asia Language and Culture Program and International Institute at the University of Michigan. I also wanted to thank all of you in the audience for making a time and to come to my talk today and I'm sorry, uh, come to the talk today. And before I dive into my research talk, I would like to share some of my personal reflection of what's transpiring in the United States and the rest of the world lately. And as Alison pointed out, I am sure it is affecting everyone in the audience and it certainly does affect me. Global pandemic of the COVID-19 and racial injustice are triggering a political and a social economic unrest. In the United States, but also around the world, global climate change are causing catastrophic damage across the globe. Wildfires in California, last year in Australia, and devastating powerful hurricanes and typhoons is disrupting and displacing so many life in the United States and less of the world. When the sky above me turn into the color of the dark Halloween orange, which I'm sure many of you have seen on the news. I can no longer pretend that our world could and would somehow fix itself and find a way back to old normal way of life. In fact, what's transpiring in the world today, let me wonder if what we used to have before wasn't normal at all. This experience reminded me of the little conversation that I had with my late grandfather. As my profile suggests, I am descendant of the colonial migrant from Japan, uh, from Korea, and born and raised in Japan. My grandparents came from Korea to Japan during the time when Korea was a colony of Japan. My maternal grandfather, whom I was very close to, 
was only 12 years old when he came to Japan. He had lost his own father to illness. He was the oldest son in the family. His youngest sibling was only baby. So my grandfather packed up, came to Japan as a child laborer to support his extended family in Korea. When I was 17 years old, my grandfather was battling with a cancer and then losing to that battle. I always visit him at a hospital after school. And one day, when I went to his hospital room, he was sitting on the bed and watching the evening news. On the TV, it was a news about Soviet coup d'etat in 1991. Wolves tore his life and his family apart. Cold War especially. As he watched the news about the possible ending of the USSR and the Cold War, he held my hands gently and said, you are going to see the world that I have never imagined. You will see so much more than I have. This was hard to believe because I know he went through so much turmoil in his life in 20th century. Shortly after this conversation, my grandfather's, my grandfather's life came to an end and so did the Cold War. Now more than ever, I ponder what he said and meant that day. I have hardly ever discussed about myself or my own family history as a Korean minor minority in Japan, especially when I give my research talk in the public. Public discourse on Korea, Korean minorities in Japan has been so politicized that it often, often forced people to take one side over another. As a social scientist, I've always tried to distance myself from the politics. I have been trained to be mindful of my own bias when I analyze the data and construct my scholarly opinion. And I always believe it is our duty as a scholar to present the most objective perspective. And I still firmly believe in this. But in this process, I often find myself suppressing my own insight as a direct witness to history and a social issue that I'm studying. I began to reckon if this is absolutely necessary or if I'm simply overreacting toward this internalized fear against the stereotypes toward a minority scholar studying about their own group. We all formulate our perspective be it scientific or humanistic, based on our lived experience from the position we occupied in our society. No scholar is absolutely free of the bias completely, and our viewpoint is always limited by our position in a society. Goal of our scholarship, in my humble opinion, is not to construct a single dominant narrative or perspective, but to embrace various perspectives and allow them to enrich our knowledge and open our mind on the subject that we study together. That is what we ought to strive, especially in this divisive world today. So in this spirit, I decided to incorporate my own personal experience into my talk today, which I normally don't do, but I will give it a try and I hope you will indulge me. So whenever people ask me where I am from, I really do not have a straightforward answer to the simple question. I normally say I am from Japan, but I am Korean. Or when I feel a little bit cheeky, I would say I am Korean, made in Japan. Weird, but accurate. Put differently, it is a very complex and bizarre experience to grow up as Korean in Japan. And it's, I find it extremely hard to explain what it means to people who categorize Japanese and Korean as the same racial group. By and large, public discourse and a historical narrative in Japan 
have ostensibly ignored and even denied the existence and the relevance of non-Japanese population, including Korean minority. In academic discourse, Koreans and other minority groups in Japan are often described as invisible or hidden. I must say these adjectives are often used with a good intention among these scholars who did not notice but later discovered our existence and experiences. But as far as I could tell, Koreans and other minority groups in Japan are not, have never been invisible or hidden in a Japanese society. Although the force of silencing them has always been there. I argue racism is a global pandemic. As such, racism does exist among the population where the visible and ostensible phenotypical differences are virtually absent. Because race and ethnicity are socially constructed categories, they exist in various forms. Whether visible and ostensible physical differences matter or not in the racial classification depend on the depend on the local geopolitical demographic as well as historical conditions. Meaning and the boundary of the race change from one place to another, from one historical point to another. As long as a human can imagine the differences between groups, there is always a possibility of racialization. And usually racialization and marginalization occur side by side and when these two phenomena occur simultaneously, it triggered the formation of the very durable inequality along those social categories the society constructed. In this perspective, racism and racialization have always been the global phenomenon. State, government, plays an essential role in this process. This, when the state institutionalized imagined differences among groups, boundary of the group become reified and legitimized. Once this process is activated, people in the society started treating such boundary as real and natural, and they used them to justify the discrimination against another groups. Social scientists call this process social closure and it is a main mechanism to facilitate and maintain the durable inequality between groups in a society. Citizenship, immigration laws, play a central function in this mechanism of social closure in modern societies. Koreans in Japan are among those who are racialized and marginalized at the very particular moment of history and their racially marginalized status was institutionalized by the legal system, including citizenship and immigration laws. Those systems then led to the construction of the durable racial inequality and injustice against Koreans in Japan. My talk today unpack this process, but it also addresses how Koreans' reaction toward this process contoured in turn trajectory of the Japanese national boundaries. As many of you already know, Japan is not usually known as a country of immigration. In fact, Japan maintained its facade of a monocultural and less diverse nation for many decades since World War II. While the number of immigrants in Japan is on rise, it remains significantly low compared to the other, other industrial democracies around the world. For example, percentage of the non-citizens, non-Japanese citizens among the total population in Japan remains only 2.3%, which is about seven times lower than the United States or other Western European countries. Unlike other industrial democracies in the world, Japanese state and public do not openly embrace the notion of the multiculturalism, plural, pluralism, 
or cultural diversity either. In fact, anti-immigrant sentiment, racism, xenophobia have been pretty blunt and pervasive throughout the Japanese society. However, despite the lack of the public support for the multiculturalism and diversity and the low admission of immigrants, Japanese government has made the drastic reform in immigration and citizenship policies and laws in the past few decades. These recent changes enable the extension of the various citizenship rights to non-Japanese resident aliens. While it, is, it was not materialized, Japanese cabinet at one point seriously explored even the possibility of the alien suffrage for the prominent resident aliens. This development was remarkable considering other countries who consider themselves as a country of the immigration of the multiculturalism would not discuss such a possibility at that time. This liberalized access to citizenship rights strongly signal the decoupling between nationality and citizenship that is taking place in Japan for some time. And I thought that this deserved the scary attention and needs to be analyzed. Citizenship scholars and social scientists have seen this denationalization of the citizenship rights as a global phenomenon. However, many scholars disagree the implication of this phenomenon. Some of them see the decoupling, separation between the nationality and the citizenship is a welcome maturity of the universal liberalism and a cosmopolitan civil society. To these folks, cosmopolitan and post-national citizenship is not only possible, but a desirable outcome to achieve. Other critics against this argue that decoupling of, of the citizenship and nationality is an unwelcome sign of the declining state sovereignty and the significance of the nationalized citizenship and national identity. Therefore, denationalized citizenship is undesirable as it undermines the preservation of the nation state. This is really the heart of today's immigration debate in the United States as well. People see extending rights to the non-American citizen as a threat to the American nat national identities and nationhood. I do regard this debate very important, but my goal here today is not to settle this debate once for all. But instead, I would like to explore how these phenomena, these competing phenomena, ostensible denial of the multicultural diversity and liberalizing access to the citizenship could exist together in Japan. And I wanna explore what factors and actors trigger this phenomenon. Between 1990s and early 2000, I have observed the state sovereignty over the citizenship rights has become greatly circumvented in Japan due to the strong minority activism and external pressures from the United Nations and other bilateral relationship with the nation, other countries. However, this does not necessarily lead to the acute decline of the significance of the Japanese citizenship, nationhood, or sovereign power, contrary to the critics of a cosmopolitan or post-national citizenship have argued. Some immigrants groups in Japan enjoy great degree of the denationalized citizenship rights. However, other groups do not enjoy those rights to the same extent. To figure out what is causing this uneven distribution of the citizenship rights to the different group, I have reviewed the series of the legal cases, policy debates among the key ideologues such as the jurists, politicians, intellectual journalists, and activists in Japan in the past several decades. Having reviewed this data closely, I identify the several factors and the mechanism that might be responsible for triggering this uneven distribution of the citizenship rights among the different um, immigrant groups in Japan. But before I 
dis start discussing these findings, let me briefly summarize the key historical background, which greatly matters to what's transpiring to the citizenship rights in Japan today. Decoupling between nationality, citizenship, and a territorial sovereignty is often mistakenly viewed as a contemporary phenomenon. Sociologists are often guilty of such a misconception. But this was already happening at the periphery of the various empire in the 19th centuries and 20th century. European empire made their colonies extrajudicial space removed from the purview of the liberal principle of consent. This was also the case for the imperial Japan who emulated a European colonial model. Imperial state of Japan deliberately decoupled nationality, citizenship, and the territorial sovereignty. When they acquired the colonial territory, namely Korea and Taiwan, they unilaterally extended the Japanese nationality and citizenship status to the people in their colonies. So as a result, Koreans and Taiwanese are declared as the imperial citizens of Japan. And Koreans and Taiwanese are not even allowed to abandon their imperial citizenship status during the colonial time. While the imperial Japan legally recognized their colonial population as the Jar Japanese, legal Japanese, they heavily exploited and controlled their po colonial population as a de facto alien, outsider to their country, to their society. The colonized population hardly enjoyed the same set of the citizenship rights as the Japanese, even though they were labeled as a Japanese. Family registration system, known as a koseki, legally demarcated their differentiated sta status within the empire. However, it is worthy to note Japanese state did not uh, did allow Koreans and Taiwanese to enjoy some degree of the privilege as Japanese. For example, Koreans and Taiwanese are allowed to exercise the suffrage rights so long as they were male taxpayers who reside in Japan proper. While the number of such individuals was small, there were a few Kore Korean elected officials during the colonial period exercising the citizenship rights that they had. Also, many Taiwanese and Koreans are allowed to enter mainland of Japan to live and work as well. Toward the end of the World War II, population of Koreans in Japan proper increased exponentially and well exceeded 1 million. Toward the 1945, the population of Koreans in Japan was nearly 2 million. Many of them are drafted to come to Japan to fill the labor vacuum created by the Japanese military draft. And the majority of the labor immigrants returned to Korea um, toward the end of the World War II and um, after the war. And that's where you see the sharp decline of the Korean population. Only toward the very end of the Japanese empire, imperial state began to consider extending more citizenship rights to colonial populace widely in order to further assimilate the population for military draft. But before the full extension of the citizenship rights was materialized, Japanese colonial rule and empire came to an end in 1945. Throughout the Korean uh, colonial period, imperial Japanese state carefully coupled and decoupled nationality and the citizenship in order to strike the delicate balance between their assertion over the legitimate ownership of colonies, their own colonies against the Western powers and their superiority over the colonized population in the name of their effort to build the Pan-Asia empire. In other words, Imperial Japan had this competing interest. On one hand, they wanted to claim their superiority, racial superiority over their colonized population. But at the same time, they know that 
they were viewed as the same race as the people they were governing. And they, that's why they wanted to proclaim this pan-Asian empire and to assert the ownership over these population that they wanted to claim and also assert their superiority over. And they, they reconcile this competing interest by coupling and decoupling nationality and citizenship flexibly. As the Japanese state lost the war and the colonial territories, they prepared to reconstruct itself once again, but this time shedding from the idea of the Pan-Asian Empire, they tried to reconstruct their new nation state as a homogenous state, um, nation. To this end, many policy makers and ideologues advocated to embrace their defeat and divorce from their fascist imperialism and construct the new national self-image as ethno-racially and a culturally homogenous nation. In order to reconstruct this new national self-image as a homogenous nation, they contemplated what they, what they are going to do with the remaining Koreans and Taiwanese in their territory. And the Koreans were the largest non-Japanese population in Japan at that time. At, as a part of their strategy in dealing with this population, post-war Japanese state tried to couple the nationality with the citizenship closely again. Based on the historical evidences that I have reviewed, there are a deliberate effort among the Japanese policymakers to exclude remaining colonial immigrants in Japan. And this sentiment was best illustrated by the Kiyose Ichiro's memorandum um, submitted to the parliament. In his memorandum, he forcibly argued that government should halt the suffrage among the Koreans and Taiwanese remaining in Japan immediately without waiting for the San Francisco Treaty to be signed. Kiyose believed the Koreans are the communist sympathizer and if they allow the political power and uh, you know, rights to these communist sympathizer, they would harm the Japan's effort to reconstruct its nation as a democratic you know, um, countries. And they alleged that those Koreans who support the abolition of the emperors must be the Koreans and you know, sympathizing with the communism. There are a few policymakers who advocated that Koreans and Taiwanese should retain the Japanese nationality and citizenship rights, especially if they continue to live in Japan. But this position was not supported in the parliament at that time. After some heated debate, post-war Japanese government did follow Kiyose Ichiro's recommendation and issued the cities of the imperial ordinance and declared the state would regard the colonial immigrants from Korea and Taiwan as alien. They no longer have the Japanese citizenship rights and they strip the, all the rights away from these population. Supreme commander of allied power led by the United States did not oppose to this decision made by the Japan, Japanese government. In fact, the SCAP also viewed the Koreans in Japan as a threat to the Japan's peaceful de democratization and a post-war reconstruction. SCAP bias and a Japanese discriminatory sentiment against Koreans fused together and allowed the post-war Japanese state to develop the very exclusionary and dr draconian policy to control the remaining colonial subject in Japan. American former director of the immigration office was brought to Japan and served as an advisor as the post-war Japanese government drafted their immigration laws, which was used mainly to control the Koreans in Japan. When the San Francisco Peace Treaty was signed in 1951, approximately 600,000 Koreans and Taiwanese are remaining in Japan. They officially lost their Japanese citizenship status and became the resident alien. And they became the subject of a deportation and had to endure the various structural and legal exclusion as a result of this legal status change. Outbreak of the Korean War and a subsequent division of their homeland discouraged 
discouraged these remaining colonial immigrants from Korea to return to their homeland. As a result, they became succumbed to the daily oppression as a marginalized minority in Japan. Many Koreans in Japan at that time tried to educate their children Korean language with the hope that one day they might be able to return to their countries. Teaching their children their language, Korean language, was largely prohibited during the colonial period. So after the war, many Koreans started privately run ad hoc schools um, throughout their own community, especially in the Kansai region where the majority of Koreans live. However, these schools are viewed as a hub of the communism and threat to the Japan, Japanese society and security. Therefore, the Japanese government unilaterally ordered the closure of these privately run Korean schools and forced the Korean children to attend Japanese school. Many Koreans were not happy about this decision. They regard this order as the legacy of the colonialism. Therefore, this order triggered the strong resistance among the Koreans. Many Koreans protested against the Japanese state oppression. And such resistance, however, met with the blunt force of the violence by the Japanese police force. An American-led um, spree commander of Allied power did not stop the Japan. In fact, uh, the fir first state of a Emergency in the post-war Japan was declared when the uh, Korean protested and Japanese um, police forces were crushed. One of the notable incidents was the Hanshin educational struggles where hundreds of Koreans peacefully marched on the street to protest the Japan's order of the unilateral closure of their school. However, the protests resulted in many uh, arrests and deportation of Koreans and as well as unfortunate death of the 16 years old Korean student protester. Public sentiment toward the Koreans' outcry for their ethnic rights, identity recognition, was often met with a criticism and sentiment from Japanese, such as, if you are not happy in Japan, then just go back home, go back to your home, home country. I was also bullied was the same sentiment by Japanese peers when I was growing up in Japan. After a really long day of school bullying experience, I came home and I asked my grandfather why he did not return to Korea. And I literally accused him, why didn't you go back to Korea after the war? So we did not have to deal with these racism and discriminations. Whenever I ask him, this question. He looked very sad, but his response was always simple and yet poignant. Because I thought, he said, dealing with the discrimination, racism in Japan was better than dying out of starvation in my homeland. Later in my life as a scholar, as I studied about the Koreans' experience in a post war, I realized it was very well documented. Korean returnees also met the severe discrimination from their fellow Koreans in both North and South Koreas upon their return. They were denied of opportunities to live and housing and a job. They are often called half Jap and traitor by their own fellow Koreans in their homelands. So these remaining colonial immigrants from Korea became known as a Zainich Korean, which literally means Koreans living in Japan. They suffered from the very insecure legal status for several decades after the war. Their suffering was, very, was depicted in various novels and a film. And most recently, it is depicted in a best-selling American novel called Pachinko. And so many people know what it was like to survive in Japan as a Zionist Korean. By classifying these Korean as an alien and systematically exclude them by laws, Japanese state institutionalized the boundary of the Japanese and the non-Japanese. This practice further nurtured Japan's new sense post-war 
new sense of the national identity as a homogenous nation. In doing so, Japanese government made their citizenship law, citizenship couple very closely with exclusionary sense of the national identity, which further justified their discrimination against the ethnic minority groups in the decade following the end of the World War II. However, since the 1970s and the 80s, nationality and the citizenship in Japan started being decoupled again, contrary to the colonial period this time. Decoupling was triggered by the rising social, social movement among young Koreans in Japan, which emerged in the late 1970s. Koreans in Japan have been always politically active. This is probably the main reason why they were viewed as a threat to Japan and became the target of the state scrutiny and oppression. But their political solidarity to create the uniformed, powerful social movement was largely circumvented by their internal division, their divided political alliance between North and South Korea's. Japanese states' differential treatment toward North and South Korean also made this division worse. For example, in 1965, when South Korean government and Japan signed a treaty, which also include the term to secure the legal status of remaining colonial immigrants in Japan. This was not extended to those Koreans who self-identify themselves as North Koreans. However, since the late 1970s, many young Koreans who were mostly second and third generation overcame this previous political division within their own community. They were largely inspired by the civil rights movement in the United States and other independent movement around the former colonial country, including South Africa, as well as a rising global discourse of the human rights, which was becoming very popular at that time. They started mobilizing themselves, calling for the extension of citizenship rights in Japan. Their movement succeeded in abolishing various structural barriers and a discriminatory practice against Koreans as well as other resident aliens from 1980s onward. For example, abolishment of the citizenship requirement to become a licensed attorney, pirate, public servant, postal service workers, public school teachers, nurses, and caretaker, all these occupations barred the Koreans from acquiring is among the direct fruits of their activism. And I remember when I was in school, my teacher was telling me ex with excitement, now you become a teacher. There's a nationality clause was removed for you to acquire these occupations as a Korean. They also successfully convinced the Japanese government to remove the finger practicing pra uh, practice fingerprinting practice for all the long-term resident aliens. This was successful. Uh, this was a pretty remarkable success in my view, considering that fingerprinting requirement is a very common practice in other liberal democracies around the world. And I remember when I was acquiring American green card, I have to give the, not only one fingerprint, but the 10 fingerprints just to get that. So, this was a pre pretty remarkable achievement for their movement. Their movement was successful in part because of their international lobbying effort. They heavily lobbied with the United Nations, human rights committees, and other supranational organizations in order to raise the awareness, global awareness of their marginalized status and experience in Japan. Many media abroad, including BBC, New York Times, and Le Monde, started covering their stories around, the, around that time. This further added more international spotlights, spotlight on their lobbying efforts and Japanese exclusionary practice and laws against minority. They also lobbied with their homeland government, South Korea especially, who by then became the Japan's very important regional partner in politics and economy. 
As a result, their movement succeeded to create the additional pressure through their homeland state. And Japanese government responded these internal and external pressure and it began to revise its immigration and citizenship law extensively since the late 80s. Their movement also received wide support from the Japanese public, contrary to the immediate post-war era. This is because Korean activists framed their claim in the language of the universal human rights rather than particular ethnic identity politics. These changes combined together simultaneously coincide with the Japanese government new immigration policies to accept the temporary labor migrant from Latin America and various parts of Asia. Responding to the declining labor force in the manufacturing sector due to the aging and low fertility rate, Japanese government started issuing the special family visa, which virtually allowed the Nikkeijin ethnic Japanese from Latin America to enter Japan and work as unskilled workers. State also introduced the internship and training visa, which also allowed the entry of the inexpensive short-term labor force from its neighboring countries and Asia as well. In 2007, for the first time in the post-war history in Japan, number of the so-called new immigrants, newcomers, exceeded that of the colonial immigrants and their descendants. Despite these new immigrants arriving at the time when the liberalized access to the citizenship for citizenship rights for the Dainich Koreans are happening, these new immigrants are largely excluded from such privilege the Dainich Koreans and Taiwanese began to enjoy. Instead of universally extending a citizenship rights to all the resident aliens, Japanese government began to introduce the hierarchical classification of, immig classification of immigrants. And the most recent and decisive changes in their illegal system of the immigration happened in 2012, when the more than half century old alien registration system was abolished and they replaced it by the new residency management system in Japan. Under this new system, Japanese government extended the category of the labor immigrants while tightening the control over undocumented immigrant population. And they distinguish the immigrants' legal privilege accordingly based on this classification scheme, which I summarize in this slide. All the colonial immigrants and this, their descendants from Korea and Taiwan are at the top of this hierarchy. They were classified as a special permanent residence. This is a legal status that you cannot acquire by applying for it. You, ha you have to be the descendant of the colonial immigrants recognized by the state in order to have and maintain this status. And this group enjoyed the most of the citizenship rights in Japan, probably only rights that they cannot enjoy, on only one of the most um, important rights that they cannot enjoy was the suffrage. But apart from that, they have a right to the national pensions, you know, various um, benefit uh, the citizens in Japan can enjoy. And their legal status is far more secure than other category of the immigrants. For example, this group do not face the threat of deportation just because they act in antisocial behaviors. Examining the policy debates in uh, 90s and early 2000, it became very clear to me that this phenomenon resonates with a particular framing used among the key actors. I observed the frequent and direct references to the particular historical background of the colonial immigrants and other immigrants. Rather than debating the extension of rights as the issue of the universal human rights, as they did in the 70s and 80s, Policymakers and Zionist Korean activists and their supporters 
started to discussing whether the Japanese government should further extend the rights to these colonial immigrants and their descendants as the part of the historical reconciliation and repatriation with their former colonies. Opponents also cite the same colonial history to base their argument against such extension of rights. In other words, as their framing started to shift from universal human rights and particular historical rights, we began to see this differentiated classification and treatment of the immigrant groups in Japan. Another notable change is the series of the reform made in the Japanese citizenship laws in the past few decades. Unlike other legal reforms, Korean activism was really successful in making an impact on the conditions necessary for the birth rights for the Japanese citizenship. Unlike other countries, such as the United States, Canada, and France, Japanese constitution does not directly define the condition for being or becoming a Japanese citizenship. Article 10 of the Japanese constitution, I'm sorry, constitution simply state that condition necessary for being Japanese national shall be determined by the law. This basically means that a constitution in Japan gives so much so sovereign power to the state to define what are the conditions to acquire or to be entitled to the Japanese citizenship at birth. Despite the fact that Koreans in Japan have challenged the state citizenship law by filing the various lawsuits, neither state nor court consider any reform as a response to their claim. Most significant change in the post-war Japanese citizenship law was a result of the international treaty the Japanese government signed with the United Nations. Prior to the 1985, the post-war Japanese citizenship law was explicitly patriarchal. And unless you are the person of the ch biological child of the Japanese father and recognized as such by him, one is not entitled to the Japanese citizenship at their birth. This prevented many children born between non-Japanese father and Japanese mother from enjoying the Japanese citizenship from the birth. Ever since the post-war citizenship law was enacted, Koreans attempt to sue the Japanese government for this exclusion at the birth to no avail. However, after the Japanese state signed the seat of the United Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against the Woman, government quickly changed its citizenship law to allow the children of either Japanese parents or you know, mother or father to acquire the Japanese citizenship law at birth. And this change still excludes the children born in a wedlock. And this was again revised in 2008. This reform derived directly from the Japanese constitution's article 98, which stipulated that Japanese state must change its law if they sign the treaty that does not meet the requirement of the treaties. This is exactly the reason why the many Korean activists choose to lobby with the United Nations and other you know, um, extra transnational entity as a strategy to prompt the legal reform in Japan when they are not successful by the domestic legal measure. These rulings and a change in both citizenship and immigration law in the past and recent decades suggest that there are very important points for us to consider in order to understand the nature of the relationship between citizenship and nationality in the society. First, we can learn from the Japanese experience how malleable and fluid the relationship between the citizenship and nationality could be and what that means for the peoples in Japan. Japanese empirical case demonstrates that how the boundary of the citizenship changed flexibly, corresponding to the unique historical context, states and regional interests throughout the modern history. This fluidity is often cited as the sign of the weakening or declining significance of the citizenship, nationality and state sovereignty. But the empirical case from Japan suggests that it is not that simple. Precisely because of this fluidity, state of Japan was able to sustain 
it's institution it's institution significance of institution of the citizenship in a way that they wanted for the most of the time despite the various pressure from outside and inside during the colonial period this marriability and fluidity helped the imperial japan to construct its national self identity as a pan, pan asian empire to assert the ownership of their colonies without compromising their own sense of superiority over their colony. And since the 1990s, fluidity of the citizenship boundaries allowed the state of Japan to unevenly distribute the citizenship rights across the different categories of immigrant groups in Japan. So that a state can continue to selectively exclude unwanted immigrant population while improving the treatment of the colonial immigrants and their descendants whose homeland state became very important regional partner to them. In either case, significance of the citizenship hardly declined, but rather it continued to assert that its relevance to all lives in Japan. Secondly, the force of the globalization had a very significant effect on the way in which citizenship rights and the nationhood are imagined among people institutionalized and practiced by the state in the past few decades. Globalized notion of the human rights and the transnational human rights movement by, led by the various minority groups played a very important role in triggering the decoupling of the citizenship rights and the nationality in the recent decades. As I mentioned earlier, the relationship between the Japanese constitution, state's law, and the international treaty also played a very important role in deciding what kind of strategy activists could use in order to exert their influence over the state's legal reform. However, state's ability to control the colonial immigrants' right is not circumvented equally across the, all the immigrant groups in Japan. That is to say that degree of the state ability to limit the immigrants' right is also dependent on the nature of the relationship and the history the state has with the immigrants' homeland states, as well as the level of the activism among the group themselves. Sorry. Zionist Koreans' case clearly exhibit this tendency. Zionist Koreans' access to the Japanese citizenship right was gained during the period when the Japan and their homeland state, particularly South Korea, had a relatively stable relationship. However, as bilateral relationship between Japan and two Korea deteriorates, especially under the previous Abe regime, rights extended to Korean began to erode. Most recently, government, Japanese government decided not to extend the state subsidy for early childhood primary education to Korean schools, and Japanese law workers so far has supported the government's decision. It remains to be seen what kind of impact declining bilateral relationship would have on the status and the legal rights and activism of the Zionist Koreans in Japan because much of the dynamic influencing this is still very much underway. As much as the force of the globalization had a significant effect on the way in which the citizenship rights and nationhood are imagined and are practiced in Japan in the past few decades, they are still very much anchored in a particular regional history and the colonial legacies and geopolitical agenda for the future. As a scholar who followed this contentious trajectory of the citizenship, nationhood, and people's struggle for justice in Japan, I observe the current situation with a great concern. However, at the same time, people in Japan also present a reason for me to be hopeful. Alliance among the immigrants beyond their ethno-racial background is forming gradually and expanding in the contemporary Japan, especially at the municipal level, suggesting that grassroots of the civil society among the marginalized population in Japan is not yet pruned, but it continued to grow 
despite raising xenophobia, racism, and, and anti-immigrant sentiment. In fact, brand racism against a minority group across the board usually facilitates the unity among the marginalized population. So let me wrap up my talk today. If you ask me what would happen in Japan now or in the near future, my answer will be very similar to what my late grandfather's father told me before he died. Japan and the world will probably be very different from the one that I have known and lived. We cannot choose the circumstance in which we live and the change we hope for may take longer and probably different past than we want. However, we are always able to imagine our future differently than present and past. Social change, as many scholars noted, requires discipline, patience, and a commitment, but it is always feasible and inevitable. Scary knowledge could help facilitating people to imagine such a change, hopefully the positive change. This is the lesson that I learned from studying about this particular group's struggles throughout the 20th and the 21st centuries in Japan, as well as my own family. Thank you so much, and I end my presentation here. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. And what a wonderful image that you've included here at the end. Um, they look fantastic. <laughs> Those are happy days. <laughs> it looks great. Um, so we have we have some questions that have come in. So thank you to everyone who has already written in a question um, and I'll share those. But I first wanted to start with a with a really nice comment. Um, Paul in Tokyo um, had, had been watching and then it got to be about 2 a.m. his time. Um, so he needed to leave, but he left a really nice comment that he very much enjoyed it. Um, and I thought that's a nice way to start because one of the, I'm not particularly invested in silver linings of COVID. I'm not, not that positive a thinker, I guess, but um, it is a wonderful thing that so many people can join this event from all around the world. So I wanted, I want to acknowledge that and thank him for joining us. Um, and for him and for anyone else, there will be a video recording of this shared. So um, if you, if you need to leave or if you'd like to share with other people, it will be available. Um, so from questions, um, please feel free to, to, to type your questions and, and um, I'll share them with Professor Shin. Um, Michael has a long question that I won't read the whole, th the whole thing, but um, to share, um, Professor Shin, I think you might have particular uh, knowledge about this because it's about being from Osaka, which I know you also are. <laughs> um, so he says, uh, the Japanese government does not promote multi-ethnic society because it's promoting assimil assimilation. Um, but looking at what's happening in other multi-ethnic societies in the West, the approach to achieve that might not actually be the right one. Um, he says, I always say to Americans that I'm from Osaka, not, not, not from Japan. A Japanese subjugated us after our loss in the Battle of 1600. <laughs> Osakans have different language and culture. Um, so he says, in my opinion, Osakans are like Catalans in Spain, Bavarians in Germany, Scottish in the UK, and some other examples. The Japanese government since the Meiji era has succeeded, unfortunately for me, in his opinion, in assimilating Osakans residents of former provinces as well. So uh, do, you do you have, a, I thought as, as a, a native Osaka, you might have a, a great response. <laughs> yeah, I, I, at the sky level, I absolutely agree with Michael that uh, force of the mage states assimilation, I mean, even predates that assimilating that um, the regional diversity within the Japan. Japan has a very rich regional diversity, so much like in the, um, UK and Europe, um, but those differences are ignored. But I don't know if the Osaka fully assimilated into the mainstream Japanese national culture. I feel like they, we were Osaka first and foremost before we were Japanese in some ways. So yeah, um, that will be my response. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, David asks, how will the Suga administration approach this issue, the new prime minister of Japan? So this is all absolutely speculation, probably not fair to the 
Prime Minister Suga just started this week or very recently, he will probably, um, based on what I know, uh, do what the, his president did, Abe regime. I don't think he will be very different from other previous regime in regard to his policy toward the resident aliens and immigration issues in Japan. But the COVID-19 certainly changed the um, directions of the way they look at the, um, the situation as well. So I'm, um, I, it's, it's right now at this very moment during the pandemic, it's really difficult for me to predict what the Suga administration would do. But in a normal circumstance, he would probably do what the administration would do, um, will erode the rights um, against the Zionist Koreans and tighten the immigration control while continue to exploit the unskilled labor um, through the temporal, um, very insecure immigration uh, visa system that which currently Japanese government is using. So that will be my educated guess. Wonderful. Um, so Katharina also says, thank you so much for the lecture um, without a question. Um, Julia asked the question, after thanking you for the fascinating presentation, can you talk a little bit about the intersection between Zainichi civil rights activism and other social movements in Japan, such as the women's live movement in the late 1960s and 80s, mm -hmm. sorry, 70s and 80s Japan? Um, uh, this is a very complex situation, but um, but oftentimes in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of alliance across the different uh, minority groups and, you know, uh, the uh, women's rights movement as well. And I, I remember seeing the archival documents where there's so many meetings of the Zionist Korean female activists and a Japanese uh, feminist uh, scholars and collaborating. Also the intellectuals are, you know, the feminist uh, scholars as well as the Korean, um, Zionist Korean ideologues are having the, you know, uh, collaborations. In the 70s and 80s was, I would call it heydays of the social movements where the alliance was desired and promoted. Um, I'm not sure if that strong solidarity is still continuing in Japan in the same way in the 70s and 80s, but it is my um, impression looking at the data and talking to the people that alliance was forming in that time. But um, the Koreans' movement in Japan was still very much read by the male fi activist figures. So I don't necessarily recall, you know, they explicitly talking about the female rights or putting it as a forefront. But the, the language that they commonly use as a framing of their claim was really the universal human rights, which generally includes the women's rights as well. So. I don't know if that answered the question, but I'll just leave it there. Leave it at that, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, you have another uh, gratitude from Michael. It says, great talk, Professor Shin. Um, Miho asks, why are many Korean colonial, why do many Korean colonial immigrants not apply for Japanese citizenship? Are there any requirements for colonial immigrant families from Korea or Taiwan to become a citizen? Um, for example, Japanese spouses, and says, okay. my friend's father was a colonial immigrant from Taiwan, and he eventually got Japanese citizenship. So this is always a different, good question. Abs, thank you so much for that question, and um, a little bit complex to answer. It really depends on uh, um, who you are. Um, there's a no universal reason why there's so many Koreans still do not acquire the Japanese citizenship. Um, but in actually, the number of the Koreans acquiring a Japanese citizenship is on rise, and this is the reason why uh, the Korean population is declining. It's not that we are dying out, <laughs> extincting, but it's because more and more Koreans are acquiring a Japanese citizenship. Usually at the time when they marry to the Japanese spouse, they decided to take the Japanese spouse. They wanted to enter the Japanese spouse of family registry, therefore they abandon the Korean citizenship and to be the part of the house, same household record. 
right? And then so that their children can be also be the part of the family record in Japan, which is a very important deal. Therefore, the many Koreans who intermarried to the Japanese decided to take the Japanese citizenship in order to take care of the bureaucratic hardship for their children and also the discrimination as well. And some Koreans do retain the Japanese citizenship, I mean, so, sorry, the Korean status, non-Japanese citizenship status, partly because of their strong identity. And, you know, the, when I talk to those Koreans who choose to retain the non-Japanese citizenship status, despite the, some, the fact that they cannot vote and they can't participate in, uh, um, you know, politics directly, and they say that, well, we used to have a citizenship. Why do I have to ask for the citizenship? So, uh, naturalization process in Japan for Zainichi Koreans are becoming very, very um, streamlined. And then I do see the state intention to encourage more Koreans to become naturalized so that statistically, the number of the Koreans in Japan would decline. Therefore, it will make it difficult for the Koreans to make a claim to be recognized for the right, I mean, rights. And it's easier for the Japanese state to, you know, to deal with the Korean issue if the Korean willingly, voluntarily become Japanese citizen. And then, then the Japanese, city, Japanese state don't have to um, expand the citizenship rights to the non-Japanese citizens anymore, right? So the Japanese government has been streaming line the naturalization system, um, uh, process for the Zainich Korean especially. It used to take a three to four years for one to become naturalized as a Koreans in Japan to become a Jap Japanese citizens. But I think these days, if everything is less complicated, you know, if you are the employed by the Japanese company, or if you have a Japanese spouse, naturalization process is a very quick and smooth. You, um, it, it can be as quick as six months that you can get the Japanese citizenship. And I know this for the fact because I used to be a assistant and also the private investigator for the uh, lawyers who specializing in uh, immigration laws and a naturalization uh, process for the many Koreans. And at, in that early 90s, it was still very difficult to become naturalized, but these days it was um, streamlined for Koreans in Japan. And um, so, so that, I'm sorry, it's a really long complex answer, uh, but there's a many reason why. And then, so I should also mention that the North Koreans in Japan, um, they don't necessarily, they were considered the stateless people in Japan because Japan does not have a diplomatic relationship with the North Korean government. So there's no North Korean embassies in Japan to issue them a North Korean passport. I have a South Korean passport and my South Korean passport is issued in the, Jap the Korean consulate in Osaka. And so my passport looks always strange. Korean pa you know, passport, but issued in Japan. And and then, but the North Koreans cannot have the, Jap the North Korean passport because there is no embassy to issue that. So, um, so this can really be tricky, especially if you want to travel outside of Japan, right? And you don't have a passport to travel. It is still possible, but it's a very, very complex situation. So many North Korean kids, um, you know, when they face this structural barriers for the freedom of the movement across the border, they just, they, some of them do decide to abandon the North Korean status. But when they do, they don't necessarily take the Japanese citizenship. Instead, they, they take the South Korean citizenship rather than Japanese citizenship because of that sentiment that I described before, that they do not want to ask to be Japanese, become Japanese. When, you know, you know, when they see that as the birthright to those rights. Okay. so. I'll Thank stop you. there. No, that's a wonderful answer. I'm also remembering, I feel like that's a plot point in, do you remember the movie Go? Yes. The 1990s. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. the, the North Korean passport was a plot point. Thank you so much. We have wonderful questions coming in. Um, Suk, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you for your question, which is, with the decreasing population and thus the labor power, how might that influence the government's future immigration policies? Um, I 
So I'm not sure if I understand that question correctly. Um, so that now, as their number decline, it's a, it's a hard to always quanti quantitatively understand the power of the Korean movement. In terms of demographic population, it seems as though the Korean population declining on the statistic, but we, as I said, we are not dying out <laughs> as a Korean. We are becoming more and more difficult to be seen on the government census because we don't, when the Korean become naturalized Japanese, we disappear on the state census record, right? Because the Japanese census does not ask your ethnic background or you know, racial background. They can only collect, understand how many Koreans are living through that, their citizenship status. So on the, on the graph, the Korean population might be declining, but that doesn't mean that those Koreans who acquired the Japanese citizenship stop being politically active or less vocal about their identity politics. So I do see many Koreans began to participate in a different way in the social movements as the, you know, Zionist Korean who don't have the Korean citizenship anymore. Some Koreans actually choose their ethnic name when they become naturalized, which by the way was a requirement before, but no longer. Japanese government used to require all the naturalized citizens must have the Japanese name, Japanese sounding name. And some of the small restaurants from Hawaii also took the, come up with some Japanese name as a result of those requirements. But they were considered discriminately by the United Nations and they did change that requirement. And so today, the Koreans can become Japanese, but it can retain their ethnic name, like a Korean name. And the most famous person is the Son Masayoshi, right? CEO of the Yahoo Japan and SoftBank Japan. He continued to keep his Korean name. But that those Korean Japanese are very vocal about their identities, and even though the Japanese citizenship status has changed. So, um, so I still, you know, the, I think the Koreans began to view the citizenship differently in recent years um, as they create the coalitions or solidarity within the social movements. So thank you for that question. And I hope I understand your question cor correctly. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a question from Kuni. Hi Kuni, Kuni's one of my students. It's nice to, nice to have this connection. Um, he says, to think about the impacts to form minority activism in Japan, such as Zainichi Koreans or LGBT populations, how much about globalization and external pressure matter compared to local bottom-up activism? Um, and he's saying, of course, they're complicated and intertwined, but sort mm -hmm. of external pressure versus bottom-up activism. So I like to look at those two phenomena simultaneously because they don't exist in isolation, right? And even in some cases, the external pressure alone can change that um, domestic legal, you know, reform. But if there was a no bottom up demand for that change, I don't think the Japanese government spontaneously, okay, let me change, revise our citizenship law. And then they won't, won't be interested in signing the international treaty. So, um, so I always see these two phenomena um, simultaneously uh, for that reason. However, the most important denominator for social change is always a bottom-up movement. And I say that as a scholar who study about the social movement. But in the recent decades, whether that bottom-up movement can be successful to attain their desired outcome really depending on how they navigate the external pressure. In the case of Koreans in Japan, and also Ainu movement, and LGBT movement, I think, they, they were, these days, a lot of the bottom-up movement utilized the technology such as like, you know, Snapchat and TikTok and all those social networking, um, you know, technology to create the global awareness more rapidly. So the many 
especially the young activists is you know approaching the bottom up movement in a in a more global way in a way so a lot more savvy you know more in a more savvy way than <clears throat> than um the previous generation and so so i yeah, I guess I, I'm having a difficult time to separate these two dynamics because they are always, always intertwined, especially nowadays. So thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you for that answer. It's very thoughtful. Uh, Yi Ming says, thank you so much for the talk and the touching story. Might you talk something about immigrants from Manchuria and Ryukyu Islands after 1945? Thank you. Uh, immigrants from Manchuria. Uh, they, I, I'm not sure if you were talking about the Chinese immigrants from Chi Manchuria or Japanese returnee from Manchuria. After the 1945, there was a uh, many, many, many returnees from the Jap returnee Japanese that left from Manchuria. And then they had to be incorporated back into the Japanese society. And then um, the government was very adamant about turn incorporate the, incorporating the Japanese returnees and also the Ryukyu Islanders into the purview of the Japanese nation state. And then they, but you know, of course, on a day to day basis, they were viewed as um, a differentiated population. I probably shouldn't pretend as if I really know about this subject. I just only know the various books that I've read, but I have never really studied about this population directly myself. But from my study, one thing I can talk about is that the many Japanese settler, colonial, former colonial officer who came back from Manchuria and Korea were absorbed by the municipal offices and they began to become the local bureaucrats. So I wrote a paper to argue that these returnees um, actually played a very central role to continuing and the legacy of the colonialism at the municipal level as they treat the um, local um, population from the former colonies. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question directly. And it's in part because I don't really studied about these population. But that's also my limited insight about that topic. Thank you. That's very helpful. Alexandra asks, um, first says, thank you for this wonderful lecture. As someone who has not had much insight on this topic, I was wondering if you could recommend some sources or places to learn more about the history and experiences of Koreans in Japan, as well as the current movements taking place. Thank yeah. You. And then write me an email <laughs> and then I'm happy to sent you the list of the references and I have so many. So um, hopefully like the book that I finished will be the one, <laughs> but, <laughs> which is not done yet. So I wish I have already written that book. Yeah. So that means we can all look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> um, Toshiki says, I heard one of the reasons why Japan would not allow dual citizenship is because they do not like ethnic Koreans to be holding Japanese and Korean citizenship. Um, this right. extends for everyone, regardless of their ethnic origin. For example, once I became a naturalized U.S. citizen, I lost my Japanese citizenship, even though I was born and grew up there and, and, and until I was 15. Mm -hmm. Is this a credible hypothesis, hypothesis or just an unfounded speculation? I tried to get to the bottom of that question. And I, the, the uh, well, it, if it, if it was off the record, so I can't really say. <laughs> um, there is a probably my educated guess and speculation is that the Koreans has been always the population to consider when they extend that dual citizenship. I mean in fact when they when the every whenever the state consider the dual citizenship they always have to consider that which population would have that you know which will be the largest population who would have the dual citizenship. And they have to consider the, their homeland state's you know, situation. So when it comes to the Koreans in Japan, it's tricky um, that 
um, because South Korea still does have the military draft and, and the Zionist Koreans are exempt from that requirement uh, uh, because of the treaty, which is also the direct fruits of the movements that uh, Koreans read in Japan. Um, so, but one, one thing I learned is that many Japanese citizens who acquire the citizenship later in, you know, later in their life actually retain the Japanese citizenship because the Japanese citizenship law does request people to abandon the Japanese citizenship, but that does not have any criminal or legal punishment to retain the Japanese citizenship. On top of that, a new citizenship that you uh, acquire. However, however, if you are non-Japanese citizens acquiring the Japanese citizenship, the Japanese state require you to present the proof that you do not have another citizenship at the time they are granted the Japanese citizenship. So if you are a natural born Japanese citizen, so you acquire the Japanese citizenship at the birth, there is an unofficial way to maintain the dual citizenship status. And I know the Japanese government keep reminding those people to abandon the, choose one or the other. But in, in reality, I know quite a few people do retain uh, full citizenship secretly from the government. And then government is not cracking down as hard as they could. I'm not sure. I, I, I have a good sense of why that's the case, but it, that is based on the information I heard from off the record from people who are close to drafting those policies. So I can't really share publicly, but I would just say that every population who will be subject to the dual citizenship, if they do change the law, will be um, considered. And then publicly, there was a discussion. The South Korean government actually pressured Japan to do it because South Korea was prepared to embrace the dual citizenship in a very limited scope, not like in the United States, Canada, and France, but in a limited scope. When the South Korean government was revising their citizenship law to extend the you know, category of the group who can enjoy the dual citizenship, um, I know the Japanese government was approached and uh, considered, ultimately decided not to. And in that context, they were definitely thinking about the ethnic Koreans issues when they you know, thought about that dual um, citizenship possibility in Japan. So yes, the Koreans issues are very, very important point whenever Japanese state consider the possibility of the dual citizenship. I think we only have time for one more question. Yeah. There's, a, there's a wonderful list of questions in the Q&A um, and I've been told that we will be able to save those. Um, the organizers will be able to save them. So if you have a question that we haven't been able to answer, we, we will try to answer it hopefully over email later. Um, but for the last, so if, if you want to add a question now, please feel free. Um, David, let's, we'll have David's question last. He says, I may have missed this in the presentation, but have Zainichi activists pursued solidarity with immigrant rights groups more broadly? For instance, advocates for immigration, immigrant laborers' rights or against sino, uh, sinophobia. Right. So this is actually uh, ongoing dynamics. I don't have the concrete answer to it because that's that dynamics of forging alliances is really happening right now and then i don't know whether they are going to be successful but effort has been made so that as the new immigrants come to japan and as korean continue to fight for the extension of their rights in many ways it was easier when they were the biggest minorities in japan to frame their claim right but as the population of the, Japan, uh, the immigrants from China or even Korea and other part of Asia do come, um, and then the number is exceeding their own population, there, has to, there, there are a divergence of the interest. What those you know, newly alive the immigrants, first generation, 1.5 generation wants, and the Korean wants, it's different because the Korean already won most of the stability, stability of the citizenship rights, which new, newly classified excluded immigrants um, just don't have. 
So in a way, when the state began to differentiate the immigrants group, that actually had this adverse re consequence, making the forming the coalition among the differentiated immigrant groups very difficult because the amount of the rights that each group can enjoy is differentiated by the state. And even though the fact that Korean enjoy so many citizenship rights was the you know, fruits of their labor movement, now the Korean, what the Korean wants is a birth right to the citizenship and as well as a suffrage. But other immigrants wanted to have, you know, threat of deportation removed, the re-entry permit, permit being extended. So the divergence of differences, the fact the state is separating these groups is making it the coalition forming among the immigrants group that much difficult. But this does not mean the many, you know, seasoned Korean activists do not see the common uh, problem among them. Because after all, as the hate speech against the non-Japanese become increasing in Japan, Korean clearly see that these new immigrants are subject to the same xenophobic racism that a Korean have been endured. So in that regard, the, there are approaching to the immigrants' coalitions and, and also advocate group. And then the immigrants' group themselves are also fragmented. And then their basis of the social movement is still at the very infantile stage. So, um, so that I can still see the many challenges for the coalition to happen, but I do see the strong evidence of intention to create a unified front is still is there, especially in the younger generation of the activists. I'm sorry that we can't all clap, clap, you can't hear us all clapping for you, but thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, all of the information you shared, the framing you gave us. I feel, I feel energized and happier than I did this morning. Um, so maybe that's just me, but I certainly don't think so. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope, thank you everyone in the audience for being here um, and staying with us and asking these wonderful questions. I hope you might be able to join us again in two weeks. So thank you so much, Professor Shin. Thank you.